I could hardly talk. Even yesterday morning when I got up, it was like, <clears throat> this is going to be rough. So we'll see how it goes today, getting off to a fairly good start. But now that uh, I've got this fancy microphone that hangs around my ear, I don't have to quite, uh, I can just talk real quietly and you can hear me what I'm saying anyway, right? So, good. I'd like for us to turn our Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter 5. The book of Luke, chapter 5. And I just want to look at the last few verses of chapter 5 for our scripture reading, beginning with verse 27, and uh, we'll read through verse 39. Chapter 5, verse 27 to 39. What we'll do today is we'll kind of build up to this passage, and then we'll go from this passage and, and uh, come on down a little bit from there. So, chapter, Luke chapter 5, verse 27. After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. Levi made him a great feast in his house, and there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at table with them. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. And they said to him, The disciples of John fast often and offer prayers, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees. But yours eat and drink. And Jesus said to them, Can you make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. He also told them a parable. No one tears a piece from a garment and puts it on an old garment. If he does, he will tear the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins, and it will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. And no one after drinking old wine desires new, for he says, the old is good. Now, <clears throat> we're going through this book of, uh, of uh, Luke, talking about the life of Christ. In talking about the life of Christ, what we want to do is to learn from Jesus. In English, we would say, learning from the horse's mouth, as it were. I tried to find out what that means. Where do you get it from the horse's mouth? But uh, just kind of one of our English sayings that you (laughs) came from a farm, I'm quite sure. So uh, the thing is that after Jesus is baptized, he goes into the wilderness. And there he's in the wilderness for 40 days. He's tempted all during those 40 days. And at the end, we're told that there's a severe temptation because he's greatly hungered, having gone 40 days without food. And... We're given uh, an illustration of three of the temptations that he went through and how he responded. We saw that he responded with the Word of God. So now as we come to this passage of Scripture, we find that here stands a man named Jesus who passed the test where the first one failed. The first man is Adam. Adam was also tempted. He also had the option to obey God or not, but he didn't. He, gave, he failed the test. So now what we're going to see in Jesus is the ministry of a man, a person who is fully submitted to the Word of God, because Jesus then, in every response, when the, the devil attacked him, when the, when the enemy attacked him, he responded with Scripture. The first man, Adam, though he had the Scripture, did not follow what the Scripture said. Jesus goes from this experience then, it begins the last part of chapter 4, to go throughout the area of Galilee, preaching in synagogues the Word of God. And he's the new kid on the block. 
it would be good for us to understand what it's like to be a Jew. For 400 years, there's not been this prophet. For 400 years, there's not been this voice from God. This guy named John comes out of the wilderness and begins preaching a very fiery message. He stirs people's hearts. They wonder if he's the one, and he replies and says, nope, not me. I'm just here to prepare the way for the one to come. And then Jesus comes, and he's baptized, and the sign then of the Holy Spirit coming upon him and the, the voice of his father saying, well done, I, I'm, I'm very pleased with you. And so and then Jesus begins preaching in the synagogues, and the word of this, of this, about this new guy begins to spread all around. There's, there's such a sense of anticipation that this is not the first time, folks. There, there had been others who had come along who had preached a message of hope and of, and of uh, expectation. People responded to them. Sometimes they even responded violently, and, the, and there was these insurrections in following these people. But for Jesus, there was none of this violence. But I, I want to say that within the heart of the Jewish person, there is this sense of anticipation that the kingdom of God is coming. He's going to restore it, and they're waiting for that person. We saw how he went to his hometown. He preached this message of grace, which is to be to all people. Ah, that didn't work. Somebody said, just like, uh, uh, I'm not going to say it. It wouldn't be very, it wouldn't be very cool. But uh, it fell flat. In fact, is his hometown people turned against him and said, we don't want your message. So much so, they took the hometown boy up to the cliff, and they were going to throw him over the cliff. The Bible tells, he, uh, tells us he walked right through the midst of them somehow invisible. He goes down to the, to the village of Capernaum, and there in Capernaum, Jesus' message is accepted. He heals many people. In fact, there's a demon-possessed man. In our day and age, we, we tend to question these things about the, the, the demon possession. At least what we would say are, how should I say, our Western way of thinking uh, tends to be more rational, and we don't believe in this in this spiritual hocus pocus. And and and, uh, uh, but outside of our of our Western culture, as it was, there's a lot of people who believe in in a, in a demon world and a spiritual world. And and I would be included in one of them. I grew up in Taiwan, uh, and uh, I saw some I saw some things that I can't give any explanation for, except that there was some spiritual activity going on. Uh, <clears throat> in many places, there's the understanding that there's a world beyond ours that cannot be seen. It's a, world, it's a spiritual world, and there's an activity that's going on in this world, and we're, throughout the Scriptures, we're told about how Jesus confronts those who have been overcome and overwhelmed by some spiritual being. And he casts that being out. And so he casts out a demon, a, a man who's possessed with a demon. He heals Peter's sick mother-in-law. And then he heals a leper. And we come to a story about the, the paralytic who, um, this is really an incredible story. We're not going to spend much time there. But four friends, have a, have one of their friends is paralyzed. He's incapable of moving at all unless somebody moves it. They hear that Jesus is in, is in town, and uh, so they say, we're going to take our friend to Jesus. They believe that Jesus could do something for him. So they get to the house. The house is jam-packed. They can't even get one person in the door, much less are they going to get four people carrying a, a, a cot into the house there. And whatever possesses a person to do this, I, I really don't know. But they decide they're going to destroy the guy's house, and uh, they're going to open up the roof and let him down. i got to tell you something, folks. You don't fool around with the roof. It, the, we just moved into a new place on the seventh floor. I met the people on the seventh floor. Do you know why? Their roof was leaking because they're on the top floor, and uh, you don't want to be on the top floor <laughs> unless you've got a really good roof. So uh, I guess the longs know all about the leaking roof, eh? So they moved out, the next people moved in, and the roof still leaks. I, my question was, how long are they? But, but here's the thing. They go to this guy's house, and they start taking up his roof. And opening it up, 
and they're put, they put down this uh, man expecting something from Jesus. I, it's interesting how little conversation we know about this whole thing, how little is being said. And they put this man down, and Jesus then says, your sins be forgiven. And, oh, that didn't go over too well. Everybody knows nobody forgives sins but God. And here's this guy from Nazareth. Nazareth? Where is that? And this guy from Nazareth then says, your sins be forgiven you. The religious, the religious people there, they just really, they bristled at that. And Jesus knew that. And so he says, is it more difficult for the Son of God to forgive sins or to heal the guy? Just to show you that I'm the Son of God, he says to the man, take up your bed and walk. The guy takes up his bed and heads on out of there. Pretty amazing story. Actually, there's a whole lot of things that go to it. But it was from there then that uh, Jesus goes down to, uh, uh, I mean, he, he leaves there, and he meets Matthew, and then Matthew is called into the ministry. Now, what I'd like to do is this. Here in Capernaum, Jesus calls his first followers. First of all, Peter, James, and John. And then Matthew is called Levi. And in the first part of the chapter 5 there, where he, he goes to call John, let's, let's look at uh, uh, the first part of chapter 5. Because here's the first time that he calls out some people to follow the first disciples. So on this occasion, uh, the crowd was pressing in on him. And so Jesus says to these guys, to Peter and James and John, he says, uh, lend me your boat, let me sit in it while I teach. So getting into one of the boats, verse 3, which was Simon's, he asked them to put out a little from the land. He sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep, let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down your nets. Now, here's the thing. Jesus grew up as a carpenter, not a fisherman. Carpenter, not a fisherman. So uh, he's there, and, and this crowd keeps pressing in around him. And I, I would imagine he's, he's getting closer and closer to the edge of the water. Uh, I, I, I've been in the Orient long enough to know how crowds work. And uh, so, and they keep coming around him, and, and there's no other choice but to get in the water. And so he asks then Peter and John if they would come in and, and let him get in the boat. So he gets in the boat, and now he's out from the shore a little bit. And he begins to continue, he continues his teaching until he finishes and completes his teaching while these fishermen who have been out all night are out preparing their nets and getting ready for the next, the next night out. And so then when Jesus is done teaching, he says to Peter and John, uh, he says, listen, guys, let's Take your boats out into the deep and drop your nets and go fishing. I'm not a fisherman, but I've been told that there are times when fish feed and fish respond, not in the middle of the day. These guys are fishermen. They had been fishing all night. And what they do is they take their nets, they make kind of a, a half circle, and then they, they, they bring it around, and then they begin collecting the nets. And they had been, they had been collecting the nets all night long, not one we're told, not one fish. That's got to be pretty discouraging. So now we have a carpenter who's a teacher telling them, okay, guys, let's go out now when there aren't supposed to be any fish anyway, and let's go fishing. So it's no surprise to me that Peter says, well, hey, we've been out there all night. We didn't catch anything. But the next phrase is interesting. The next phrase is interesting because typically we might say, and besides that, you're a carpenter. What do you know about fishing? But Peter doesn't respond that way. He says, Nevertheless, I'll go because you said so. So what is it about Peter then that has caught his attention to say that he's going to go anyway? Well, we have to step back a bit because you remember it was Peter's mother-in-law who was very sick. Jesus had gone to Peter's home. His mother-in-law was there. She was very sick. Jesus healed her, and she got up and then began ministering to everybody. Following that, the Bible tells us that there was a great crowd of people that gathered around. He healed people. Uh, he healed everyone, it said, and he cast out demons. Peter is watching all these things. So, while Jesus may not be a fisherman, Peter says, this guy knows what he's doing. So, if it's the middle of the day and he says to go fishing, all right, I'll do it. And they did. They collect, uh, or Peter did. He collected his nets, went out there, and threw them down. It's hard work. You know, I mean, it's, these guys are burly guys. They, they go out and drop the nets, and 
it's amazing because the nets were absolutely crushed full of fish. They had such a hard time bringing it in that he had to call his partners to, to, to help them bring in the nets. They filled both boats completely full. How full? Until they're starting to sink and make their way then back to shore. On the way back to shore, Peter says, depart from me, he says, because I am not worthy. And uh, in fact, his, his words are this, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. Now, a couple of things I want us to see there. It's interesting that Jesus' response is not what a person does, but who a person is. Peter doesn't say, hey, I'm a great fisherman. He really couldn't say that after what just happened, could he? But he says, I am a sinner. I'm a sinner. He recognized it wasn't what he does. It rec he recognized it as who he is. And in order for him then to, to permanently change, it's going to have to be something not changing what he does, but changing who he is. And so Jesus then calls these guys and he says, I want you to be followers of me. There was a radical change in Peter's life at that time. Peter, James, and John left everything they had, and they followed Jesus. Verse 11 says, and when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. And Jesus, that was the beginning of those who were his followers. There were many people who were interested, but not many people who then followed. Then, then we, we look at this <clears throat> passage of Scripture in, also in chapter 5, in which Levi is called. And uh, you look in verse 27, this passage that we read, it says, after he went out from this home where the paralytic was healed, he saw a tax collector named Levi say, sitting at the booth. And, and again, this is something uh, maybe we understand a little bit better today than we used to. But uh, how many of you just love the tax? Uh, well, I first need to ask, are there any tax collectors in here? <laughs> <clears throat> I have this ongoing thing with the IRS. They are into everything. They, they, they want to charge me for income tax in the state of Missouri. I haven't been in the state of Missouri for who knows how long, and they want to charge me income tax. I'm saying, oh, you guys are nuts. Anyway, that's another story. So I have this, I have this, I know what it's like to despise a tax collector. And tax collectors were not very popular people. Jesus comes to this tax collector named Levi, and in two words, now we don't, we don't, there's only two words of record, okay? Those two words of record are this, follow me. And here's what the Levi, what Levi does. And after this, he went out, saw a tax collector, and, and, and he said to him, follow me. And here again, Matthew, the same thing. Leaving everything, he rose and followed Jesus. The interesting thing about Matthew is this. Not only does he leave everything, he then throws a party to announce his decision. He says, I'm going to invite all my friends, all tax collectors, and I'm going to invite Jesus. This is going to be my resignation announcement. I'm leaving. I'm following Jesus. Well, <clears throat> the interesting thing is, when we look at this picture about how Matthew calls all his friends, we see an, a tremendous picture of this new message that's coming about called grace. So, the religious people are there who, they're not going to have anything to do with those tax collectors. They're sinners. They're on the other side of the fence. They're on the other side of the ocean. We don't want anything to do with them. There's a big gap between us and them. There's us and there's them, and we're not going to go in between. They're sinners. But they see Jesus, who calls himself now Lord and God, and he's amongst them. So they're asking his disciples about that. How, how, does, how does that happen? 
And Jesus tells them, he, he, he says, God's grace draws sinners, and Jesus is drawn to sinners. Now think about this. How does that work for us? Are we seeking out opportunities to mix with sinners, to be the picture of Jesus Christ? Are we, are we seeking opportunities to mix with those who may be non-believers, those who we would say, you know, they're just not the character, they're not the kind of people I want my kids to be around, I don't want to be around? Are we saying, let's keep our distance? Or would we, like Jesus, if we were invited then, we would join? For the purpose then of showing them what grace is. You, you see, folks, what we see here, something great and new is happening. There's, there's a change in the thinking that's taking place. There's a whole change that, that's uh, greatly and deeply affecting this, this Jewish culture. First, first of all, there's John the baptizer. John the baptizer is coming in and he's talking about this great vision that he has and, and there's someone who's coming. Now Luke begins to unfold for us this creator, Yahweh, Jehovah, this son of man, all together in one person. We see how this one person then, he's, he's living in their midst, living amongst them. He's not just someone whom, who, he's, he's not the latest prophet to come around. He's not even John the Baptist who has this great, fiery, powerful message and is baptizing the, uh, in, the, in the waters of repentance. But he, Luke shows us that he who is God and man in one person is now walking about and think about this. Not only was Jesus born in this little tiny manger scene amongst the animals and the shepherds, very, very small, very insignificant, very, very ordinary as a matter of fact. Now we see the same Jesus who in his lifetime probably never left the area of a county. He never left the area of Israel, the district of Israel, where Jews live except for an occasional foray, maybe across the border back. The, the fact is, here today in the year 2013, we are profoundly affected by a man who traveled little or none in his life. He wrote no books, went to no schools. He had nothing of any merit of his own to, to present. And yet this Jesus is one who profoundly moves us today through his teachings and his writings and particularly through the people whom he influenced. It's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. And when we look back on it now and we look at it through the eyes of Luke, we see now that in the Jewish uh, perspective, something is happening. There, there's this change that's taking place. And so we have to ask ourselves the question, will the thoughts, the practices, and the teaching of Jesus, how are they going to fit in his setting? The fact is, they don't fit. The rules, the social rules and the traditions just come right up against the thoughts and practices and teachings teachings of Jesus, and, and this Jewish society, they, they, they hard, a certain part of them hardens against it and rebels against Jesus and will not have anything to do with him. In fact, is he's eventually murdered because of the fact that he never fit in to their crowd, their group. Dr. Luke takes us then from several different angles and shows us the impact from, of this man from Nazareth. He's bringing in a new day. I think it's good for us to look at this because this is a brand new year. How many of you have failed your New Year's resolutions already? Oh, you don't have to raise your hand. How many are you still keeping? You can raise your hand. You still have your New Year's resolutions. Still in How many of you didn't make any New Year's resolutions? Ah, uh, safe, safe, safe. Yeah, yeah. Shame on you. <clears throat> I mean, come on. You know, you know how come we got to the moon? Because we were shooting from Mars. If we want to make, if we want to make some, some progress in life, set a goal. Take a step. You know, uh, make it the second floor. Maybe you only get two steps, but it's better than none. So I want to encourage you to make some New Year's resolutions. Take some, there's, you say, well, it's already passed. No, nah, come on. It's 
only been six days. You can do this. But uh, uh, for me personally, and I, 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 uh, I, was very, I was too public last year about my <laughs> New Year's resolutions. I'm not going to be quite so public this year. But for me, they're much more of a, of a spiritual nature. Because, and also having to do with, with certain aspects of uh, what we're doing here is in ministry. But I think it's an important time when, when we have these new opportunities to turn the page, write some things down on the next page, or better yet, ask God to tell you what to write down on the new page for goals, aspirations, ambitions that you would like to attain in this coming year. Because if you, if you don't set that up, you have no direction to go. You won't, go, you won't make any, any progress if you don't have any goal to head towards. So I want to encourage you to do that. And for those of you who did and failed already, I have one piece of advice. Never, 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 never quit. Never quit. Just start all over. Keep going. Do it again and again and again. Never quit. And you will see progress there in your life and steps in the right direction. I, I want to share with you some things that we're bringing in this new day. This is a new, a new age that's coming in. It's God's new age that's coming into this time through this person, Jesus. And so I, I want to share you some, with you some things about that. First of all, look with me in chapter 5, verses 30 to 32. I think we read this passage of Scripture too. Uh, chapter 5, verses 30 to 32. Uh, the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled at his disciples. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Look here, then, in this new, this new way. Sinners are sought. Sinners are being looked for. They're being sought for. Jesus says to them in this passage of Scripture, those who think themselves righteous do not need a Savior. Let me say that again. Those who think themselves righteous do not need a Savior. Now, they don't know that they need a Savior. But you know something? My experience has been that there's too many people who think themselves righteous. Consequently, they have a hard time accepting this whole religious thing. This whole God thing, you know, because they think of themselves being pretty good, pretty good folks. And the reason why is because if we want to think of ourselves as being good and righteous, then we have to have something to compare to. So we compare to the person next door who, uh, we know the story on that person. I'm not as bad as that person, so I must be pretty good. You know, I don't know, I'm not sure. I and we can always find someone whom we are better than, or at least that we think that we're better than. So, we have a sense of self-righteousness. Therefore, I don't need this uh, religious stuff. You know? And what Jesus is saying is that in order to enjoy grace or to appreciate grace, one needs to know their need for God's grace. And that's where, that's where people need to come to. That's where we all need to come to. <laughs> we all need to come to the place in our life when we realize that, that you know, life is bigger than I am. And, and things happen in life that are just crushing. And, and I need someone to deliver me. I need someone who's bigger. And, and to know then that God has graciously, and that word grace, if you substitute gift for grace, you're, you'll likely come out with a very good understanding that, because, you know, times we take this word grace and we give it to all these religious connotations and it's lost in the religion rather than in the fact that it's a gift that God gave his son Jesus Christ to us. He gave him to us to deliver us from our sin. We live in an age of forgiveness now and through the forgiveness that comes through Jesus Christ and through the gift of the indwelling spirit of God within us. We live by grace, the gift that comes from God. And so, he says to these religious people, the Pharisees and, the, and so forth, you, you, you guys are righteous. I didn't come for you. I came for those who know that they're sick. Tax 
Tax collectors are never very popular, but in Jesus' day, it was worse. They were extortionists. More than that, they were working for the Romans or for Herod. And their necessary contact with Gentiles put them under political suspicion, collaborating with the enemy, and ritual exclusion. They might be unclean. It's significant that when Levi throws a party, most of the others present are, like him, tax collectors. They had to befriend each other since most ordinary folk wouldn't have anything to do with them. And yet, Jesus was with them. That's significant. Jesus was with them. I look at that and I think in my own life, and, and, and I think, you know, I, I don't make it a habit to hang out with sinners. I don't think Jesus made it, made it a habit either. But do you know, sometimes there's this attitude in our life, you know, there's just certain kind of people, I, I, they're not like me. And uh, we might even say, they don't have the same morals that I do. So we kind of tend to back off. And yet, where do we take sick people? To the hospital, right? And if a doctor sees someone who's sick, does he run the other direction and say, sorry, you're sick, I'm not? No, because he has the cure. So for we as Christians, how much more should we be looking with compassion? Because we know Jesus. We have that gift. We've received his gift of forgiveness. And how much more we then should be willing to say, hey, listen, I know someone who can help. Instead of running the other direction. I, I come from a church background that is extremely separatist. Extremely separatist. In fact, is if you don't use the same Bible, we don't fellowship together. And it's always... It's just, I can't say it's always bothered me because I was one of them. <laughs> and it just, it just, I got to thinking that, and actually I'll tell you what changed my mind is when I did a personal study of the life of Jesus and I nearly choked to death when I came to this passage right here. Are you kidding me? Jesus was hanging out with tax collectors and sinners? I don't do that. I'm a preacher. And, and uh, I, really, I really choked on it. But you know what compelled Jesus to do so? It was their eternal welfare. He knew they had an eternal soul and that unless somebody would, would make the, the trek and to, to go to where they are, they'll never hear about this. So it's Jesus who broke into their world. It's Jesus who broke into the world where the righteous were loath to go. It's Jesus who stepped across that great divide and said, here, I stand and I'll show you Jesus. He was Jesus. When Jesus heals the leper, this is a very important uh, uh, miracle that Jesus performs. You know why? Le lepers are untouchable. In fact, is lepers were not allowed in town. Lepers had to be out of town. And yet, not only does Jesus go to the leper, Jesus touched him, and that's in the Scriptures. And, and that is profound, folks, especially for those who thought of Jesus as being uh, um, the Messiah and one of the religious type. He touched the leper. Nobody, but nobody touches lepers. And if leper is a picture of sin, leprosy is a picture of sin as it is, then Jesus came awfully close to sin in order to heal. A profound message there for us. This is, this is the new way of thinking. In the whole Jewish society, in the whole Jewish culture, it's always been one of separation. Come away. We're not a part of that. We're, we're our whole culture, mentality, our, all of our ceremonies, everything was one of divide, separation. We stay away. Boy, Jesus comes into this, and he, he breaks it wide open by going and eating with tax collectors. By the way, the fact that he ate with them is significant too. There's probably certain people that you might want to visit with, but you're not going to eat at their house. 
But to eat with someone is to fellowship with them. To eat with someone is to sit down and look at them in the face and, and, and to, to communicate and to, to be at the same table with them, to be at the same level, to eat their food, to enjoy their fellowship. That's a very important message that we get as to how Jesus related to, the, to, to these tax collectors. And then we also see in this, in this uh, passage the joy of grace. When he talks then about the, the wine skins, and uh, the patch, taking, uh, cutting material from a good coat to patch it on an old coat. Here's the thing. <clears throat> we see that the joy of grace does not accommodate the old forms and practices. And here's where our rub comes with the Old Testament, the way things were done in the Old Testament. In this, in this, in this age of grace, you see, um, we're going to come up against, and I, I, still, I still believe that fundamentally Christians do not understand what the grace of God really means. What it means to have a free gift given to us from God. Free gift, no strings attached. Grace. Jesus crossed the divide and came to us. We live in a time of forgiveness of sin. Jesus did that. And, and the, the thing is, it's hard for us to understand because our whole upbringing and everything about us from the time we're little tiny children to the time we go up through the, the whole uh, co education, college, university, and the whole corporate structure, everything is based on merit. And yet, we claim salvation by grace with no merit. It's, it's very hard for us to understand that. And so the the joy that these, these disciples were experiencing here, the joy of grace, then uh, these, the, the religious type, the Old Testament type, they came along and they said, sorry, this is the way it is here and, and you can't do that. You can't. Why is he eating with sinners? And rather than have his disciples not have the answer, Jesus steps in and gives the answer. He says, I didn't come for the righteous. You think you're righteous? Then fine, you don't need me. The frustration for us, though, is how to make the old fit the new. How to make the old fit the new. And Jesus is not trying to make the old fit the new. He has made all things new. So to impose fasting on Jesus' disciples who were, who were really enjoying his presence, who were drinking in the divine grace, would be like patching an old garment with new material. There's a note, though, that, Luke's make, that Luke makes at the very end of the chapter there. Uh, if you look at the very end of chapter 5, <clears throat> he says this, And no one after drinking old wine desires new, for he says the old is good. Very interesting. Everybody knows that old wine is better than new wine. I, I say everybody knows. I'm sure not everybody does know, but uh, that's that's what they say. That's what they tell me. That anyway, that uh, old wine is better than new wine, There's, and that it needs to age for a while. But what, he, what he's saying here is that there are those who much prefer the old ways. They're much more comfortable with it. They're much more understanding of it. They prefer the old ways. They don't like the new wine. And uh, so he says there, the old, uh, they, so there are some people say, you know, I'll stick with the old. The old is good. There's no word of condemnation there. But we also do know that there are those who, because of not wanting to leave the old, they fought against the new. They resisted the new with great force. Now, <clears throat> as we come into, into chapter 6, we begin with this passage on the Sabbath. Again, I, I've, I've talked a lot about the Sabbath. And in our day and age, there's, an, there's a connection of the Sabbath with the law. And I want to be quick to point out that the Sabbath doesn't, isn't a matter of connecting to the law. The Sabbath is a rhythm and a pattern that was established in Genesis with the creation. Just like God made a, a, a day to be 24 hours, and he gave us that rhythm of 24 hours. God also put within the human form the rhythm of a seven-day rest. That's a God-given human rhythm. It wasn't a matter of law. It did get put into the law because God knew that amongst like that, like other things then, uh, it was good for us to follow that. The Sabbath rest 
we need to understand is a part of our Creator's design. He designed this rhythm within us. So, the fact that we have, for the most part, rejected that, and I want to say, we should not reject the, the Sabbath because it's a rule of law. What we're doing in rejecting... <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me, just a minute here. <coughs> what we're doing in rejecting the Sabbath is denying the design of God's creation in us. And I'm telling you, folks, if you look around, you would have to say that we're not doing too well. We have health issues. We're tired constantly. And we, we find ourselves getting discouraged because we get caught up with, in so much work and we find ourselves too busy. If we would follow the design of the Creator, I can promise you, that we would find the time that we need. We would also find the rest that we very much need. So in this particular passage, <clears throat> it's the Sabbath is saved. We have, for the most part, rejected the Sabbath. One of the reasons that we have is because the traditions of the Jews uh, who and added on to the Sabbath, and by the way, the Sabbath is a, a Jewish distinctive. It's something that identified them, set them apart as being God's people, the Sabbath rest. And uh, they tacked on all these traditions, traditional teaching, which was never authorized by God, yet it was held as being binding upon all people, and it was enforced with incredible uh, uh, rigor. Now, Jesus says it's for man's benefit that the Sabbath was instituted. And the story goes in the first part of chapter 6 about his disciples walking through the field on a Sabbath day, and they're hungry. Duh, who's not hungry? I mean, so they're walking through the Sabbath day, and as they're going through the fields, they collect some grain in their hands, rub it together, and eat the grain. Uh, my, my granddad farmed. He grew oats and wheat, but particularly the oats. It was great going through the field at about harvest time and taking the, he uh, the head of oats rubbing your hands and, and uh, putting it in the mouth and, and eating it. Uh, the wheat would do that too. Wheat was a little rough, but a little tough. But um, that's what they were doing. The religious people saw that and they said, uh, 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 you are breaking the law. You're working on Sunday. Not to do that. And then they go to Jesus and say, why are you breaking the law? Now, <clears throat> It's interesting that Jesus says he, it wasn't a matter of that he, there's no breaking of the law. If you go to this chapter 6, the first part there, where it says, when, he came to, uh, when they came to Jesus, excuse me, got the wrong chapter. On a Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields. His disciples plucked and ate some heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands. Some of the Pharisees said, why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? And Jesus answered them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry? And he and those that were with him, notice, the question that Jesus is asking is this. If a person is hungry on the Sabbath day, does the Sabbath require that he must go hungry all day long? Is that what the Sabbath was about? And obviously, Jesus is saying, no, that's not. But notice what he says in verse 5 of chapter 6. In verse 5, and he says, he said to them, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Interesting to note that Jesus then uses this Sabbath issue as, a, as evidence that he is Lord. Of all the theological issues he could use, Jesus uses this particular issue to categorically declare the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. So I ask you this question. We ask and we say, uh, we, we say about our lives, He's my Lord Jesus Christ. If Jesus was using the Sabbath and Him being Lord of the Sabbath to establish His Lordship, do you then have a Sabbath that establishes His Lordship in your life? You say, well, it's not part of the, there's no, there's no rules. I'm not setting any rules. I'm just simply saying what Jesus said. 
The Sabbath, you see, recognizes Jesus for who He is. Our excuse is this. Number one, it's legalism. Well, no, it's not legalism. It happens to be a part of the law, but that doesn't make it legalism by observing the Sabbath. However, what He did then, what Jesus did was to display, uh, it was to show His ability to act with sovereign freedom in respect to the old traditions, the old laws. And He is saying then, He's shaping His community. What I'm saying to you is this, Jesus still is shaping His community. One of the identity Identifying, one of the identifying characteristics is that we go to church on Sunday, yeah? Or we have a worship day. But we've lost the Sabbath rest. We like to have church Sunday morning, 9 a.m., so we can get it over with and we can get on with the rest of the day. Now, if you're going to take a nap the rest of the day, that's all the good. And, and Sabbath rest doesn't necessarily mean that you have to go to sleep and take a nap. But there needs to be a regular day in which the rhythm of our week is broken up. And not just broken up by saying, I'm not going to do the work, but there, the rhythm of our week needs to be broken up to where there's a plot time when we withdraw from the world in which we live and we, and we spend some time in the presence of God for a spiritual refreshment because God knows that we as his people need a time of spiritual refreshment. He, he put that into our bodies. He, he made that a part of the rhythm of our life from the very earliest part, from the time of creation. God created the world in six days. On the seventh day, God himself rested. You think he was physically exhausted? I think it was a time when he was a, there was a, a, a nourishment. And we need the same thing in our life. We need the same kind of rhythm. So not only does the, in this new age is this, um, the, the role of the sinners in our relationship to them changed, now Jesus comes and with regard to the Sabbath, he says, the Sabbath is recognizing who I am. The, the, the second illustration that we find about the Sabbath there is where Jesus goes to the synagogue, and there's this man who's got this, the, the hand is all withered up and, and crooked and so forth. And Jesus sees the guy and has compassion on him. Jesus wants to heal him. And the Pharisees say, no, no, no. Can't work on Sunday like it's any work for Jesus. He doesn't touch the guy. He doesn't say any mumbo-jumbo, he just says to the man, stretch out your hand, bro. I can just see Jesus going up to him saying, shake. And the guy takes his hand and he just sticks it right out. And man, the religious people go bananas. It's like, really? Really? I, they, they, they can do that? But I look back and, and, and in all honesty, you know something? I can tell you, I can tell you that I too have had a sense of of. of of being offended because somebody did something that I didn't think should have been done, that it may have been some tradition of mine or it may have been some uh, uh, practice of mine that I had held so dear for so long and, and something that I thought was so very important and I saw somebody who didn't do it and I was offended by it. So I, I can't be too harsh on these Pharisees. What I'm saying to you is this, folks. It, it's important for us to, to step back from our regular routine and to look things freshly through the eyes of Jesus and say, whether or not those things that we hold to be so dear, whether they're indeed traditions or whether they're not uh, indeed truth or whether or not they're traditions that have been attached in some way to truth. Because we, we take the traditions of man and make them the doctrine of God. And that makes our experience so dry and so calculated. There's not the joy there. And so in this new day, there's a new way, a new promise. The Jews were looking for this promised land. They were, Abraham wanted to go to the promised land. Uh, Job and Abraham were both shining examples of how Yahweh blesses those who follow and obey him. They were very wealthy men. They were, had big families, well, eventually. And um, God did some, and, and the Jewish mind was, they were spiritual men. The whole book of Job is about this. They were spiritual, they were blessed because they were good, godly, spiritual men. But now Jesus is teaching a new calling. He's teaching them 
that there's a calling in heaven that's not on this earth. That on this earth, it's going to be different for those who are followers of Jesus. Now, this is a bit painful. But if you look again now in this chapter uh, 6, you, you go down to uh, verse 20. And we, we begin, there's not as quite a large portion as, as what Matthew does, but notice that there's four blessings and there's four warnings. He says, he lifted up his eyes to the disciples, verse 20 of chapter 6, blessed are you who are poor. Yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and value you. Spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Now, notice these, these four things are blessed, but notice what you're blessed for being. Blessed for being poor. Blessed for being hungry. Blessed for weeping. Blessed when people hate you. I, I got to be honest with you, folks. That's not the kind of world that I tell my kids about. Hey, boy, don't you wish you're hungry so you can be blessed? It's just not, not our way of thinking. But what Jesus is saying is he's, he's turned the world upside down here. Notice he says, woe to you who are rich, for you've received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. It's a new age. Let me just close by saying this. This is an age of grace. It's not the same. There's a different perspective here. Because when you look in the Bible, you know what got Jesus in big trouble? He was living a gracious life. He was giving to people who didn't deserve to be given to. He was healing a woman who was caught in adultery. This woman was caught in the very act of adultery. And Jesus said to them, the one with the first sin, you cast the stone. Nobody did. And, and Jesus said, go and sin no more to this woman. Act of grace. Completely undeserved and unmerited. And yet Jesus, in front of the religious leaders, pointed it out. Time and time and time again, we see the grace of Jesus coming against the traditions, coming against the practices and breaking forth. He goes and he touches the leper and heals the leper. Time and time again, we see Jesus going against these things and, and, and delivering people by grace. But you know what put Jesus on the cross? It was a hatred for the grace that he had given us. That put him on the cross. He goes on in this passage to say, uh, love your enemies. Love your enemies? Come on. How do we do that? The fact is, we don't do it very well at all. He gives us these guidelines, the Beatitudes. And, and, and this thing is this. It's when Jesus came on the scene, he came on with a whole new way of thinking, a whole way new way of living. It was completely different. And it was hard, so hard for people to get a hold of. But the point is this. This all happened a long time ago, didn't it? And for us, it's lost some of its freshness and its newness. This Christianity thing is not such a new thing anymore. We're talking 2,000 years ago. So we, 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 we tend to kind of get into this rut, and we lose the freshness. We lose how new it is. I, I'm saying to you this, folks. I hope that as we study through the book of Luke here, we'll push the refresh button. And we'll step back and we say, well, what did this Jesus do? What did this Jesus say? But here's the thing. As we look again at what Jesus is saying, we want to see what does what he say, says mean to us? What does what he did mean to us? Jesus did not fit in. For that he was killed. What about you and I? Can we really live like Jesus in this world today? Can we really live like Jesus in this world today? And the answer is no. No. Cannot. But Jesus can. And that's the marvel of grace. That he says, I have come that I might live this life through you. That's the marvel. That we have the presence of the Spirit of God dwelling within us. 
it's not up to David Homer to try to be like Jesus. It's for David Homer to fade back behind the cross and let Jesus live his life through me. For me to be in submission to Jesus Christ. Now, there is a new, fresh way of living a Christian life. It's not new. It's old. But it's fresh. Fresh every day. The fact is, folks, I hope that we don't come off as being righteous people. I know myself too well to know how righteous I am. We would be very well off if we would just now admit, I am a sinner. I sin. I am prone to sin. I do not merit the grace of God. We would do ourselves a huge favor if we wouldn't be so uppity about our religiosity, our spirituality. And if we would admit, I need Jesus. I need him. Father, if there's one thing we can learn from this passage, we can learn that you came to save us from ourselves. You came to save us from our, our, our stuck-up self-righteousness. God, help us to humble ourselves before you. We need you, Lord Jesus. We desperately need you. Thank you for the gift of your Son that you came to not only live amongst us, but you gave us the presence of your very Holy Spirit to live in us, to guide us, direct us, and lead us. Fill us with your very 